Hi, Eric. Hi, Akit. How are you? I'm very good. Welcome to the Tech Talk powered by uh, Maps.io. Um, before we go dive deeper into UV curing and the applications of UV curing and how it works, uh, it would be great if you could start off a little bit about uh, yourself and about Harris Nobelite. Please. Sure, absolutely. Well, um, Reyes Nobleide is a large uh, tech company that um, has divisions in all sorts of different um, areas, including um, precious metal processing, uh, high-grade quartz glass, and uh, specialty light sources. Um, and I work for the uh, specialty light source division, which is called Reyes Nobleite. Um, I'm an application engineer, so I do product testing with uh, different kinds of UV materials and chemistries. And I also do um, analysis of different kinds of uh, UV um, environmental applications for disinfection and uh, water and air treatment. Super. Uh, so would you like to share your screen and maybe we can discuss a little bit about UV curing and move from there? Yeah, absolutely. And it looks like uh, screen sharing is disabled here. <laughs> All right. Did, did it work now? Yep. One second. All right, brilliant. Uh, can you see this full screen or should I change the uh, I think this is good. This is perfect. Okay. So uh, yeah, we're going to be going over a little bit of UV 101 here today. Um, so I'm going to go through the fundamentals of uh, UV technology, UV curing, and as well as uh, UV disinfection applications, how it all works, um, a little bit behind the physics, the technology. So we'll touch on everything and uh, please uh, feel free to jump in and ask any questions as we go. Sounds good. So uh, to start off, I thought we should take a look at a picture of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Um, this is the uh, energy. This is a look at how different forms of energy are transmitted um, through space. So starting at the lower end, uh, we see uh, X-rays. Um, these are low wavelength uh, energy particles traveling through the air. You move up and you get UV into visible and then at the very high level, you get infrared. And so if like, I'm, uh, yeah. sorry, sorry. So if I'm reading it right, the UV spectrum is sort of between 200 nanometers to roughly 425 nanometers. Correct. For, for okay. useful um, UV processes, uh, we usually say that UV falls between 200 and 425 nanometers. Um, it does fall a little bit lower into the about 100 nanometers in the vacuum UV uh, region, but this is um, actually extremely energetic um, energy and it, it's actually absorbed by oxygen in the air. So UV can't transmit on Earth uh, at below 200 nanometers, um, but in an inert non-oxygen uh, environment, um, you can get lower wavelengths. Got it. And um, much like uh, visible light, where you see a rainbow of different colors, ranging from blue um, at the lower end of the spectrum and purple up until um, orange and red at the high end of the spectrum, UV also is uh, distributed through low and high energy zones. And we commonly refer to these zones as the UVA, B, C and the vacuum UV. So uh, high wavelength UV energy is um, very close to visible light, um, UVA energy, and it's commonly used for UV curing applications. UV curing is a form of uh, polymerization. So you could form a plastic uh, by a traditional sort of thermal route where you take a hot melt of different plastics and you dry it out and it becomes a hardened structure you could also shine a UV light onto a, a chemistry and initiate a chemical reaction that causes a chain reaction and causes the material to cross-link and, and become uh, harder and more functional. 
so we call it curing but it's sort of effectively in 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 a simpler words also like drying right it's like a drying process but instead of using heat we are using uv energy to dry an ink or a coating that's correct so uh, when we're talking about uv chemistry uh uv curing we're talking about an alternative to traditional sort of evaporative drying so when you think about painting um, you know, common house paint, you, you paint a wall and then you wait a couple hours and it dries. And now you have a hardened uh, paint with some visual properties maybe, um, maybe it has uh, a certain texture to it. Um, you could achieve this um, also through a different route, which is the direct polymerization reaction, which is what UV curing is all about. Okay. So instead of waiting for a solvent to evaporate off and dry, you have an instant chemical reaction that cross-links the material and causes a hardened uh, cure. Um, so then, uh, yeah, UVB, um, this is a little bit lower wavelength, um, which means a little bit more higher energy. Um, and UVB is also used for UV curing. It's also used for medical applications such as skin treatment applications. Um, maybe someone has um, some form of eczema or some form of um, other kind of skin damage. You could theoretically treat that with UV energy and there's different companies making UV lamps for this sort of process. Um, now moving even further down, we get to UVC and this is highly energetic UV energy, um, dangerous for human contact. I, I should mention all UV is somewhat dangerous for human contact. When you think about being overexposed by UV, it's very similar to being uh, overexposed and getting a really bad sunburn, where eventually, um, you know, it starts off as a little reddening and you get some skin damage and it, it could lead to, you know, skin cancer or something like that if it's a extended period of time where you're um, seeing a lot of UV. Um, but UVC uh, is commonly used for as always, UV curing applications, and it's also used for disinfection applications, or what we call environmental applications, which is using UV energy to get rid of different kinds of microbes and different viruses in, in the air or on different surfaces. So in the last two years, UVC got really famous because of COVID, and I think UVC yeah. has been used in disinfection and killing the COVID-19 as well, if I'm not wrong. Right, so UV has a long history um, in the disinfection um, application. Um, in fact, uh, UV for disinfection was initially discovered um, via sunlight back in the 1800s. Oh. And it became uh, gradually more common, more accepted. Um, by the 1910s, it was a pretty well understood science and um, by the 1930s, people were using UV lamps to treat measles in classrooms and mounting lamp, UVC lamps up in the air. And um, we've been using it for water treatment and for um, disinfection applications ever since. Got it. I've actually never heard of vacuum UV. What is vacuum UV and where is it used? Sure, so vacuum UV um, is just extremely low wavelength UV energy below 200 nanometers. Uh, we use this 200 nanometer uh, cutoff uh, because this is uh, below this energy, um, the uh, UV particles, UV uh, has so, is so powerful um, that it actually is absorbed by oxygen in the air. It breaks apart O2 molecules in the air and forms uh, ozone, O3 molecules, which is um, not, stable, um, very reactive chemicals in the air, which are potentially hazardous to humans, but also um, ozone can have different sorts of benefits for advanced oxidation disinfection reactions. Um, now, if you replaced the atmosphere in a certain space um, and you took all the air out of the space and you replaced it with an inert gas, such as nitrogen or argon, uh, you could end up with an uh, environment that could actually transmit low wavelength UV. Um, you could also do this by, it's called vacuum UV. You could suck a really hard vacuum, uh, remove all the air from a space and you have a void, and then you could transmit UV through that. And basically the UV energy, as you get lower and lower in wavelength, becomes more and more energetic, um, which allows you to 
um, have a stronger reaction to different materials, get different sorts of uh, chemical reactions and properties. And um, it can also be used in different sorts of cleaning and um, oxidation reactions. Got it. What would be an interesting application of uh, VUV, vacuum UV? Like, where is it? Have we heard of so any standard UV application? Is commonly used. Yeah, it's commonly used for industrial coatings uh, where you need a very high properties at very high speeds. So okay. when you're talking about UV curing, uh, we often say it's an instantaneous reaction. Um, yeah. It's this polymerization reaction where you shine light onto a material and it crosslinks and forms this um, a polymer. Right. Uh, with, with, with vacuum UV, um, because it's much more energy, you're able to get um, much uh, greater uh, hardness, much greater um, uh, maybe uh, uh, sur surface uh, properties where it, it's able to withstand different sorts of um, chemical or physical uh, interest, I guess, reactions. And, and so, um, yeah, a, a common uh, application might be um, the anti-fog coating on eyeglasses or lab goggles, Got it. where um, you have an extremely fast uh, process where they're making um, potentially hundreds of thousands of these uh, lenses um, per hour. And you have a very um, thin, thin coating that requires a very high degree of cure, it has to be completely Cross links, there can't be any wetness left because um, it's going right in front of your eyes. Uh, right. So that, that would be one application. Um, high speed printing is often used. They often use vacuum UV I see. as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's move on here a little bit and talk a little bit about the different applications of UV. Um, so UV is used widely in um, almost every single industry and it's uh, commonly used um, as a process. Uh, it's a means of in improving throughput, uh, decreasing energy usage, and improving reliability to the process. So we, we see it commonly used on different sorts of packaging and containers um, for printing different labels. Uh, we also see it for um, adding coatings, uh, simulated flooring coatings, coatings on automotive parts for anti-scratch resistant, um, anti-gloss or gloss uh, resistance or to increase gloss. Um, medical applications, UV is commonly used as an adhesive to bond different medical parts together. We see a lot of um, applications in electronics, um, including potting, which is to cover the surface of a circuit board with a UV coating in order to prevent any sort of dust or moisture from getting in. Right. Um, fiber optic cables are manufactured using UV lights as are semiconductors. So anywhere there is a UV, anywhere there is an ink coating or adhesive, there is a potential for UV. <laughs> Absolutely, yep. Those are our three major categories. And I'd say the other one would be thin films. And um, there's a lot of UV applications and um, the, the more you look at it, you know, we haven't even mentioned your pipe coatings. So, you know, right. you coat pipe with a UV coating, and that could add some corrosion resistance, um, allow you to install a pipe and, and have it remain for, for many years and never degrade. Right. And so, what kind of different UV lamps are there? Um, well, uh, we talked about the UV curing lamps, there are also UV disinfection lamps. So, so this is the, the UVC. These are the UVC environmental application lamps. Um, these ones are meant for disinfection and uh, they, they do that by producing low wavelength uh, UVC energy. Yeah. Um, UVC can be applied to many different uh, environments. Uh, so we see an example here on the left, this is a kitchen hood. Um, you would install a UV light in the um, filters um, above a stove top kitchen surface and any of the smoke or grease that rises up into the duct system will get irradiated by UV and broken down. And it would actually be broken down into just water and, and carbon dioxide. And you can maintain a complete uh, duct system and have it be completely clean and never have to go in with chemicals and um, there'd be no buildup of any kind of grease or, or dust. 
Um, it's also used, like we mentioned, in disinfection applications um, quite widely. So we see in the center here, uh, this is an example of a surface disinfection product. Uh, this would be used for disinfecting the inside of a yogurt container, for example, or different surfaces, a milk carton, um, different kinds of packaging material. Um, basically, by shining a UV light into a packaging before it's filled, you can extend the shelf life by one or two weeks um, easily, just by shining a light into it. Um, it's also used widely in uh, water disinfection applications. Uh, you can put a UV light into a water treatment plant, um, and it, it breaks down different microbes, and it's, it's used to disinfect the water. And, and likewise, it's used in air treatment. And we see uh, various sorts of air treatment systems here. Um, these two pictures on the bottom are different kind of complete systems that, that we make for air treatment. Um, and they're all the same sort of concept where you have a UV light inside of a enclosed chamber, or um, yeah. you could install the lamp, like you see in the bottom right here. Uh, this would slide into a duct system. Got it. And uh, it would be closed off from the outside, but any air that passes over it would be irradiated by a lot of UV energy and it would get disinfected and, and cleaned. Got it. Brilliant. So this is a commonly used technology now for COVID, COVID mitigation and treatment. And um, you know, basically the idea is if you're able to exchange the polluted or dirty air uh, with processed air that's been treated by UV, uh, you can decrease the risk of infection and improve safety in an in a enclosed space. Now, there's many different kinds of UV lamps. Um, I'm going to go over a few of the fundamental uh, different technologies here, um, but there are others as well. Um, this top left is an example of a microwave powered lamp. Um, this is what we make at Horaeus um, quite, quite notably. Um, in the middle here, we see some examples of traditional sort of arc lamps. And on the top right, this, this is an eczema lamp. Um, these are commonly used for specific uh, sort of custom wavelength energy. And on the bottom right is an example of the UV LED lamp, which is the up and coming newer technology. And I'll, I'll go over in a little more detail what all these different tech technologies are now. Yeah. So there are some spectral differences um, between the different technologies. Um, a microwave lamp or a medium pressure mercury uh, arc lamp will have a broad band output across the entire UV spectrum with many different UV peaks. Um, a low pressure lamp will have a single peak uh, in the UVC region at 254 nanometers, which is effective for disinfection. And an LED application will also have a monochromatic single output peak. Um, but typically these are higher wavelength in the UVA region, although recent uh, technological improvements could see lower wavelengths being produced by LEDs in the future. And so fundamentally, how does an arc lamp work? Well, this is uh, very similar to your common sort of uh, household light bulb or more commonly a, fl a fluorescent lamp that you might find in an office area or um, a, a, a larger space. Right. Um, basically how it works is you have an electrode on, on either side of this uh, quartz tube. A quartz is a form of glass, a high, yeah. high quality glass that transmits UV energy. And um, inside of this tube, you also have some uh, mercury and some noble gases um, like argon or krypton. Um, and basically what happens is when you pass an electrical current through these electrodes, it strikes a, an arc through the center of the um, bulb and this ignites a plasma, it generates a plasma which produces a, a UV uh, output. So you can kind of see an example here on the right. This is what the UV plasma might look like yep. to, to the human eye. Now the microwave lamp is a replacement for the arc lamp. Um, this is a alternative technology to produce uh, the same sorts of wavelengths, um, but in a slightly more stable and um, uniform uh, lamp design. Um, this uses microwave energy, like you'd find in a microwave oven, to generate UV energy. Um, it's a very similar process. Uh, basically, you have a hollow uh, bulb, like you see on top here, and um, this is placed inside of a 
a microwave cavity, and when the, it's hit by microwave energy, uh, just like the arc lamp, it forms a plasma, which generates UV uh, energy. And the benefits to having a filament-free uh, style bulb um, is that there's no electrodes, which means that they aren't going to degrade or uh, change over time. There's a constant output within the lamp, so there's no um, different uh, materials that would get stuck to different uh, hot or cold sections of the bulb. Um, you have a very consistent output. Um, every time you turn on an arc lamp, you have these little electrodes and you, you're passing current through them, so they sputter off a little bit of the material on them. Um, in a microwave lamp, it's completely empty. So uh, no matter how many times you turn it on or off, it, it won't matter. The output's never going to change because it's a closed system. Um, they also have very uh, narrow diameter, which means that they produce um, much less heat. The uh, quartz glass in a UV bulb, when it's um, operating at full temperature, could go as high as 900 degrees Celsius. And um, basically, the, the glass, the UV, the quartz becomes a um, IR transmitter. And okay. so um, the more narrow and small the bulb is, the less heat is going to be radiating off of the bulb. So if you have a heat sensitive process, you might need a much smaller bulb. Um, these kind so, of bulbs also have, yeah, go ahead. So, so as compared to an arc lamp, uh, the arc lamp life, how much would be in a uh, life of an arc bulb, for example? Well, it, you know, it's, it's an interesting question because uh, the arc lamp lifetime is measured very differently from arc lamp lifetime. Um, arc lamp lifetime, you could say, have a pretty wide range, let's say from 6,000 to 16,000 hours, um, depending on who's making it and what kind of coding they, they're using. Um, now, the, the real difference is after that lifetime, after that 12,000 or 16,000 hours um, of operation, what is the output going to be at? It's not going to be at 100% anymore. It's probably going to be down 70 or 80% of the initial output. With the, with the microwave lamp, when we talk about 6,000 or 8,000 hours of lifetime, um, there's going to be no change in the uh, power over that life. So um, I'm confused. Sense, uh, you said 16,000 hours of, uh, I thought it was roughly 500 to 1,000 hours or maximum 2,000 hours in arc lamps. Well, it depends if you're talking about like a, a low grade, um, just standard G lamp, or you could be talking about an amalgam lamp with a long life kind of coating on it that's used for disin disinfection applications. I see. Um, which are and for often, UV, for example, the medium pressure mercury lamp. For medium pressure, they have much shorter lifetimes. So they, they, would, be, they would be more in the 500 or 1,000, 2,000 hour range, like what you're talking about. I see, I see. Um, so yeah, one thing I should mention here is we're kind of skipping back and forth between different technologies. So right. uh, when we talk about the microwave bulb, this is a medium pressure bulb. Right. Um, I'll, leave, I'll jump back a couple slides. So it's a broadband output. Um, yeah. But the other significant characteristic of these kinds of bulbs is that they operate at very high temperatures. Um, mm. Like I mentioned, 900 degrees Celsius. A low pressure bulb will operate at room temperature or slightly above room temperature. So it's much cooler, it's able to last a long time. Um, you could also make an arc lamp that would produce a broadband output. And these would have um, typically shorter lifetimes and, and lower uniformity. So the applications would be different, right? For uh, a low pressure versus medium pressure, pressure arc lamp, the applications? Correct. Yeah, so what? low pressure is commonly used for disinfection applications. Uh, okay. Low pressure lamp is a uh, either monochromatic output at 254, or might also have a peak at 185 nanometers. Um, medium pressure lamp will have a broadband output across the UV spectrum Got as it. well as potentially visible and, and infrared. Right. So. So basically, the hours that you were talking about, sixteen thousand, that's mostly for the low pressure. Correct. Low pressure used for disinfection applications. Got yeah. it. Now I get it. So if we're talking about a medium pressure lamp used for curing, um, yeah, we're talking about low lifetime, and and the microwave lamp is is the longest lifetime uh, technology that that's available. Apart from LED. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that as well. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> but, uh, I'm jumping but, you ahead. Know, one thing about the LED is it, it is, uh, yeah, it's monochromatic. So it's, it's a little That's more good. similar to the low picture in a lot of ways. Right, right. Um, now, when we talk about different bulb types, um, these are the different, uh, a few of the common medium pressure uh, bulb types. So um, basically, the standard UV bulb um, is made, like I mentioned earlier, from a mixture of, of basically mercury combined with different sorts of noble gases, such as krypton, argon, neon, stuff like that. Um, and when you excite it in the bulb, it creates a, a, a specific pattern, a specific um, output pattern um, across the uh, uh, spectral output distribution, you might say. Mm -hmm. um, so you see that the top left here, this is a picture of the standard mercury bulb, which, which we often refer to as the H bulb. Mm -hmm. um, and it has output in the low wavelength, it has uh, output in medium, you know, UVB, UVA, B, and C, we would say. Okay. Um, now, if you add uh, different sorts of additive uh, materials to the mercury, for example, you add some iron to the mercury, um, then the plasma that would be formed would be different, and the UV output and spectral distribution of the energy would be different. So on the top right here, we see that by adding iron to the mercury in the bulb, you increase the UVA output and you get much more higher wavelength UV energy. If you add gallium to the bulb, like the bottom left, the V bulb, now you're getting some sort of um, visible light output in the 400 to 450 nanometer range, mm -hmm. uh, which, which could be good for different sorts of paints or coatings. And, and we'll get a little bit later into how you match up the, the bulb with the different chemistries. Okay. Um, and uh, another example, a different bulb here is a Q bulb. This is a, has in indium added to it. And um, this is also a specialty sort of distribution uh, made for quinine photo initiators. Most of the common bulbs are the, okay, let's, you, you have the sheet right here. Yeah, so, uh, you know, there's a few different reasons why you'd select uh, different bulbs. And one of the, the main ones is the uh, application that it's being used for. So um, different bulbs, uh, like we saw in those large distributions across the whole the UV spectrum, you could also sort of break it down and say, well, the primary output for the H bulb is between 240 and 320 nanometers, for example. Um, what are these wavelengths most useful for? Um, well, they're best used for curing clear materials, uh, clear lacquers, adhesives, uh, silicon release coatings, different sorts of uh, potting or filling materials. Basically, anything that the UV can easily transmit through um, is effective for these sort of uh, lower wavelengths. Mm -hmm. Now, the D bulb has a longer wavelength. Like we mentioned, this is the iron additive bulb, which produces much more UVA energy. And the longer wavelengths are better able to penetrate difficult materials, you might say. So a pigmented ink, um, which has, uh, which might block out certain uh, wavelengths of energy, um, the longer wavelengths are able to penetrate better into it. Um, also for industrial adhesives, where you need an extremely strong bonding strength, um, the longer wavelengths are very beneficial there. Um, similarly for the V-bulb, um, a, a pigmented coating would, would be um, best suited for, for this sort of curing. And often we see um, white coatings in particular being more effectively cured with a V bulb than a D bulb. Mm -hmm. um, Q bulbs, like I mentioned earlier, they're, they're used for these CAM4 quinine photo initiators, which is a specialty sort of chemistry. And uh, we also make a bulb called the M bulb, um, which has uh, different sorts of uh, wavelength outputs. I see. What are UV absorbers? So uh, UV absorbers um, is another way of seeing a UV uh, photo initiator or uh, basically as a molecule that absorbs UV energy and converts it into um, either thermal energy or uh, initiates a chemical reaction. So how is it different from a photo initiator? Is it the same or no? It's just another word, yeah, another word. It's just another word, okay, understood. So what's um, the range for M bulb? What's the wavelength? So actually, we, we've stopped making the M bulb in the last couple of years. Um, okay, but it, it was it was used for some specialty uh, experimental uh, processes, but it never really caught on too much. Um, I see. The most common bulbs, I would say, uh, are the D bulb and the H bulb. Right. Uh, those are those are definitely the most popular and most common sorts of uh, UV bulbs. Right. Um, now the dichroic reflector. So. 
we see the standard distribution of energy uh, from the bulbs. We can also modify the energy and um, adjust uh, which wavelengths are emitted by the bulb um, by changing the reflector design inside the lamp. So um, when you talk about a microwave lamp, let me go back a few slides. Yeah. Uh, this is what the lamp looks like. Uh, you have a bulb and it's inserted inside of this lamp, inside of this bulb cavity. Um, and in the bulb cavity is a large reflective mirror, right. which is made out of a highly polished aluminum. And that, that reflects all the UV energy that, that's transmitted backwards in the sides of the bulb. Mm -hmm. um, so normally uh, this sort of aluminum reflector reflects all UV wavelengths forward towards uh, the process that you're trying to initiate the UV curing on. Right. We can also modify the output by changing the type of reflector. So we can add a modified reflector, like a dichroic reflector, which changes the um, wavelength distribution by absorbing certain wavelengths of energy. So a dichroic reflector would absorb all the high wavelength, uh, infrared and visible light, and, and uh, only transmit the UV energy. Um, because it's absorbing all the infrared, this means that it's uh, emitting much less heat than normal. So if you have a very heat sensitive process, um, you might wanna look into using a different sort of um, modified reflector for that kind of process. Um, Dichroic reflectors also might have a slightly higher reflectance in the low wavelength UVC region compared to a standard, standard aluminum. So if you need to maximize UVC energy as much as possible, um, a dichroic reflector could be an option for that. Now, how does the uh, microwave lamp actually transmit or emit energy? Um, well, like we mentioned, uh, you have a bulb and it's sitting inside of a reflector cavity. So we see here in the top left, um, this empty circle uh, is a representation of the bulb sitting inside of the reflector cavity. Right. And depending on where you look at the bulb from, the, the energy will be different. So um, the reflector that we use, um, it's, commonly, uh, uh, it's commonly set up so that it's going to be uh, focusing the energy into a very tight point um, and, and maximizing the energy over a very, very small area. And so we see this uh, representation here in the middle where um, if you were to be passing underneath the lamp, uh, you'd see very low energy, and then all of a sudden you'd have a very large peak of energy as you pass underneath this focal point, and then it would go down again. Um, if you pass further away from the lamp, then you have a broader sort of low energy for a long time. Um, while if you pass through the focal point, you have a very short time, but you have a very high peak of energy. And in order to initiate a UV curing reaction, uh, you often want to maximize energy as much as possible. And the UV ray pattern can actually be adjusted. So uh, the standard ray pattern would have the energy focused into a single beam, um, or you can modify the bulb. So you move it up higher into the reflector uh, cavity, and now you're collimating the energy. So now all the energy is being projected straight down. Instead of focusing together to a point, you're spreading it out. So if you're trying to cure a 3D product, which has many different curves, many shadowed regions, um, a non-uniform surface, uh, you might want to have a additional reflectors, additional uh, control over the beam, um, so it's not focused to a, to a very small area. Right. But the energy would be different, right? When it's when it's peak, the energy would be different, whereas when it's uh, parallel, the energy would be uh, different. So yeah, one interesting thing to look at here. Now let's uh, let's say here's a standard bulb in the focus yeah. position. Um, no matter where you pass under the bulb, you're going to get the same amount of energy. Okay. Uh, the difference is the peak irradiance, the the highest uh, energy level. Uh, that's the main difference. So when you talk about passing, let's say we're passing out of focus, really far away from the lamp. Yeah. Um, now we have a very broad curve. It never gets to a very high energy level, but you have a low energy for a very long time. So cumulatively, additively, all of the energy would end up being the same as if you had a very high peak, but for a very short time, it's, it's a low energy for a long time. 
And, and similarly, with these sorts of uh, collimated energy, you're going to have similar total amount of energy, but less intense energy. Okay. And why you would want this, um, like I mentioned, it's, I, it, it could be commonly used for a 3D process, 3D. a 3D part, where you have a complex shape that you can't just, um, if you shine a single beam on it, it wouldn't cover the whole part or you, it would get blocked off by certain areas. Right. Uh, the other major benefit um, of having high energy is that you can get higher um, pro properties. So um, you might be able to get a higher hardness or a higher scratch resistance. Um, with, with a stronger energy. If you have a low energy level, it might maybe the uh, cured material would be a little softer or rubbery to the feel. Um, maybe it would be a little more flexible. So yeah. if you have a coating that has to bend, it's on a playing card, for example, and you have to bend the playing card every once in a while, you don't want it to chip and flake off. So you probably wouldn't um, irradiate it with a super intense energy. You, you don't want it to be uh, stiffened or hardened. Um, you'd rather have it be soft but cross-linked and, and flexible. Got it. So that's a little look at the um, microwave and the mercury sorts of lamps. Um, we also make the uh, LED, UV LED lamps. And uh, UV LEDs are uh, pretty different from the traditional mercury lamps. Um, obviously, they don't have any mercury in them, so they're more environmentally friendly and, and safer. And um, UV LEDs are much like um, the LEDs that we commonly use for lighting and, and TVs and, and everywhere else in, in modern society. Um, now, the difference with uh, UV LEDs, obviously, is that they're only producing energy in the lower wavelength uh, UV uh, region. And uh, one interesting thing about the LED is that it's a monochromatic output. So um, basically, depending on the diodes that you choose, uh, you can change which uh, Spectrum is produced. And um, commonly uh, with current technology, the UV LED is only producing higher wavelength UV energy up in the UVA region, uh, but it's able to create a very high, high energy level. Okay. Um, so even though maybe the total energy would be less than a mercury system, um, peak irradiance would be very high. Okay. Um, in terms of uniformity, obviously it's. Uh, different, you know, you string a long line of LEDs across uh, a process, um, it's a little different than having a single bulb. Um, you're gonna see higher uniformity, but also um, shorter uh, working distance, where um, the traditional light has reflectors built in that project the light forward. Um, a UV LED just has diodes that emit light everywhere. So, um, the closer you are to the UV LED curing process, uh, the more effective it's going to be. When it comes to LED? When it comes to LED. Yeah. Um, so let's go through some of the benefits of UV curing and a little bit of how UV curing worked. We, we mentioned this uh, briefly when the presentation started. Um, the main benefits or reasons for using UV would be Faster throughput, um, like I mentioned, the UV curing process is an instantaneous um, process. Um, there's there's no time that you have to wait for a solvent to evaporate off, no time you have to wait for a, a reaction to occur. Uh, you shine a UV light onto a material and it instantly ca causes a chain chemical reaction. Um, UV system is typically much smaller than a large scale sort of industrial drying oven. So if you're curing uh, large parts that need to be dried in a big oven that might be the size of a room or a warehouse even, um, you could replace that with a very small lamp that simply by passing the parts underneath the lamp at a higher rate of speed, um, you get the same properties as if you had waited a few days for the, for the paint mm. to dry. Um, this also obviously leads to en energy savings. It takes a lot of energy to run a large oven, um, and there's a lot of wasted energy and wasted space. Um, the faster you can have a process, the faster you can produce uh, different parts, uh, the more energy savings that you'll see. Right. Um, UV systems are also uh, often, especially modern ones, are pretty electrically efficient. So um, it's also a, it's a green technology um, in, in many cases. Uh, UV is also stackable, so if a UV process isn't occurring fast enough, 
uh, you can simply take a second lamp and add it to the process and you can increase the speed, increase the throughput and, and uh, improve the efficiency that way. Um, you can achieve certain properties that you wouldn't be able to achieve with a traditional paint or coating. Um, the UV polymerization reaction is instantaneous and it's able to penetrate deep into materials. So you don't have to just rely on um, a, a evaporative um, alcohol, for example, uh, evaporating off of the paint to, to harden something. You're, you're forcing these uh, materials to bond to each other, um, which lets you get much higher uh, degrees of um, gloss or hardness, uh, different kinds of properties. And um, because you're not using any solvents, you're not going to have these solvents in the air evaporating off. So it, you're leading to a safer working space. Nice. In terms um, of curing speeds, what is the uh, comparison? Like if he was, if somebody was using an oven versus somebody using UV, uh, is there? Um, yeah, it really depends on the UV chemistry. Um, I'd say there, there's a there's a pretty wide um, range of of, of uh, conditions that would affect uh, drying time or, or curing time. Um, often uh, the coating thickness plays a large role. So if you have a thick coating, it takes a much longer time for um, it to be evaporated uh, off to dry. Um, or likewise, it might take more energy to penetrate deeper into the thick material. Um, so I've seen a, you know, a UV paint drying process could take as much as one or two days to occur. Um, and this uh, same process could be uh, reduced to a matter of minutes or even seconds with a UV nice. curing process. Yeah. So um, I'd say UV curing is always going to be a really, really short um, time, really, really fast and efficient process. The uh, evaporative drying and traditional uh, processes could could go on for many hours or days. Hmm. And uh, we see on the right here an example of the sorts of chemistries um, and the differences between the chemistries. So on the top, we have a thermal chemistry where basically you have this um, coating that's kept uh, as a liquid inside of a solvent. The solvent evaporates off as an exhaust and what's left behind is a dry material, dry coating. Right. The UV process, you have a mix of monomers and oligomers, which are uh, monomer is a uh, it's it's a a single chain of a polymer, right? It's a it's a, a single chain of a, of a plastic. Uh, oligomer could be a, a multi multi chains, and then a photo initiator is a UV reactive material. Okay. Um, and by mixing all these together, when you shine UV on onto it, um, the photo initiator will react and, and kick off a chemical reaction. And I'll get a little bit more into how photo initiators work um, in an upcoming slide. Yep. So how does UV penetrate a uh, material? Um, like I mentioned, the wavelengths uh, do play a role here. And uh, typically, uh, we choose a lamp and we choose a bulb um, based on the wavelengths that are needed for the process. So if you have a very thick process um, or something that's uh, very pigmented or difficult for the UV to penetrate, you're going to want the long wavelength UV energy, the UVA energy. And that's because when you think about a wave or a particle moving through the air in a wave, very long, wide particle for the UVA energy. Um, this means that it's able to penetrate very deep into a material. Okay. Lower wavelength UVC energy, very, very sharp, small peaks. Um, it's almost going to contact as soon as it hits the surface material, it's going to be absorbed. I see. Um, so it's not able to get very deep into the material. Um, but on the uh, other hand, this means that you're going to get very high curing and very high properties on the outer surface. So one of the things that we see with UV LED, which produces only UVA energy, is that it's very good at bonding. It's very good at penetrating deep into materials. It's not very good for getting good surface properties. So if you need a have a very dry surface, a very hard surface, a pack-free surface, outer surface, um, you're probably going to want to use a broadband UV output and not a UV LED. Got it. So here's a little bit about photo initiators and how we work. Um, like I mentioned, the photo initiators are the UV reactive part of the chemistry. 
Um, so basically by mixing a small amount of UV reactive particles into a mixture, um, you can create a chemistry that, that reacts to UV energy and that changes when it's hit by UV energy. And um, how this is done is, is we try to match up the absorbance of these photo initiators with the output of the UV lamp. So there's many different um, types of materials that could be used as photo initiators. Um, and they would be selected for different reasons, just like you might choose a coating um, where you're trying to get different properties. Uh, some photo initiators are better for hard coatings. Some are better for you know, printed inks. Um, you know, it, it depends on the end result. Um, it depends on how fast you're trying to go and also um, on the cost, cost of the materials you might select one photo initiator over another. Um, and how these photo initiators work is they react to a very specific wavelength of UV energy to kick off their, their uh, reaction. So um, you're gonna wanna choose a bulb that produces energy at the same wavelength as the absorbance of the um, photo initiator. Mm. And um, this can be matched up uh, pretty easily uh, and, and um, by understanding the absorbance of the uh, photo initiator and then the output of the bulbs are pretty well uh, understood and, and mapped. Interesting. Okay, so let's move on to a different topic here. Uh, let's talk about the categories of UV curing. So UV curing can be used in uh, many different ways and it, it is used uh, in all different sorts of processes and applications. Um, and depending on how a UV lamp is installed, it could be used um, for, for different sorts of materials and, and to treat different kinds of um, processes. So uh, a lamp, um, we, we've kind of broken it down into four categories of how a lamp could be set up or installed into a, a process. Um, a linear process would be the uh, most uh, simple process where you have a static lamp um, and a linear part moving underneath it at a constant or, or indexing sort of uh, manner. Um, yep. A static exposure would be you take a static part and put it under the lamp. So that's probably, that, that probably is the most, the most easy basic uh, form of UV curing. Um, a three-dimensional part where you could have the parts moving either rotating three-dimensionally or moving up and down. And then the lamp could either be stationary or moving itself. Yeah. Um, so this would be curing complex kind of parts um, and designs. And then um, the last one that I'll mention briefly is the spot curing technology where you just take a little pinpoint energy and you can um, shine it on a as needed uh, on a part or, or chemistry. And uh, how do we install and use the lamps uh, safely? Uh, well, we use something called light shields. And a UV lamp um, is installed into a light shield uh, with the lamp side facing into the system. And um, a, a, a light shield is uh, defined by three things. Um, first of all, you have uh, some sort of shielding or housing to prevent the UV energy from leaking out. Uh, second, you have some sort of uh, mode of transporting or moving the materials from one side to the other, um, which is commonly see here, like a conveyor belt. Yeah. And third is we have some sort of um, air or uh, air handling or, um, or uh, cooling um, of the lamps. So yeah. these lamps operate at very high temperatures and require a constant sort of airflow to maintain their temperature and keep them operating in a stable fashion. Are these light shields and conveyor belt made of a specific material to withstand uh, uh, UV? Yeah, so UV um, is uh, actually degrades uh, many materials, um, particularly plastics. Uh, so to make a safe light shield, you're gonna wanna have uh, made out of metal, uh, something that would be able to withstand uh, long duration of UV energy. Um, also the inside of it, you'd wanna have um, non-reflective surfaces and you might want to cover up certain openings. Uh, basically, you don't want any light to leak out. You don't want to give the energy to leak out. Yeah. Um, you want to contain it all inside and uh, have it all, basically using it all for, for the UV curing process. Hmm. And the uh, lamp shield could be designed in many different shapes and sizes. Uh, we see some examples here. The one on the left is a countertop or bench top sort of conveyor where you just 
if you put it in any kind of lab or um, or office building uh, production area, uh, yeah. it has a very small form factor. On the right, you see a larger freestanding uh, conveyor belt light shield, uh, which is holding two lamps. Um, and the one in the back there, you see a very, very large light shield. That one could hold nine, 10 lamps and um, multiple rows of lamps, many lamps side by side. So um, you want to scale the light shield to encapsulate whatever process uh, yeah. you have. So let's go over some examples of uh, different kinds of uh, UV carrying processes. Um, one popular one is uh, UV printing. Um, this is a particularly uh, popular with the UV LED process where you have um, a wide sheet of printed materials moving at a very high speed and you need to dry the ink with a UV curing process. Well, you're going to want to position the lamp over the rotary uh, uh, area here um, so that all the um, parts as they move by, they're irradiated and, and dried um, in an efficient process. And actually this, this one here is showing an example of a rotating bottle or tube part. So um, you can actually cure the outside of a uh, bottle. You print um, a label onto the side of a bottle um, you would have to rotate it, rotate the bottle in order to uh, dry the entire label on the outside of the bottle. Um, so by having a static lamp and a rotating part, you can rotate um, the bottle around at a pretty high speed and dry the entire lamp in a rotational curing process. For larger 3D parts, uh, you might need multiple lamps positioned at multiple angles. So this would be an example of uh, cell phone cases that are cured with UV energy. Um, you have a rotating rack, which has parts all around it, and UV lamps, which are arranged at high angles, medium angles, and low angles, um, so that no matter what part of the uh, case gets uh, exposed to the UV, it's all gonna be dried um, and uniformly uh, cured. A uh, similar process could be used, for example, for curing uh, the outside of a propane tank. So these white propane tanks are painted um, and then uh, with a UV curable coating and then exposed to the UV lights. Uh, basically the same sort of thing, the, the um, part would be rotating and uh, would be exposed on all sides by a static UV lamps. Um, this sort of process could also be uh, scaled up to uh, cure entire entire parts. So like the side panel of a car, for example. Um, basically any three-dimensional part, uh, you could create a um, arrangement of lamps that would be able to um, uniformly irradiate it um, in, in most cases. Um, for pipes and tubes, we have very complex sorts of uh, curing uh, systems, curing light shields. Um, this is an example of a eight lamp or 10 lamp uh, system. Uh, basically, uh, you, have a, you have a long tube or pipe and you have to put a anti-corrosion coating on the outside of it. How, how do you do this? Well, you spray coat the entire exterior of the pipe and then you pass it through a UV chamber with UV lights on all sides of it. And the UV is able to uniformly irradiate the entire outside of the pipe and what comes out at the end is a dry, uh, resistant, um, protected uh, coating on, a, on the surface of the pipe. And the last uh, topic that uh, I'm going to cover um, today is going to be on uh, radiometry, which is um, another word for UV measurements. Uh, so we commonly use uh, radiometry to uh, measure and evaluate um, different kinds of UV process. It's a process control tool. Um, basically, these, these sorts of uh, devices come in all different shapes and sizes from the size of a coin up until uh, you know, a large disc uh, that you might see um, the size of a bottle cap or, or much larger. Um, basically, how these work is you have the output of a mercury lamp, which is broadband. 
and you have a radiometer that passes underneath it, the radiometer has a response to a very specific UV wavelength. Um, so when you pass the radiometer underneath the lamp, it's going to measure the energy level. Um, and uh, by measuring the energy and doing this on a uh, daily or a repeated basis, um, you're able to control a process, um, make sure that the lamp isn't changing, the conditions uh, that you're curing the parts under haven't changed, and that um, you're able to uh, have an efficient and effective uh, curing process. Got it. So what kind of readings do you get? You get a UVA reading, you get a UVB reading? Is yeah, so uh, there's many different designs of radiometers. And uh, typically, the two things that they're measuring are peak irradiance, which is the highest energy level that the part um, or the radiometer is going to be exposed to, and total energy or total exposure. Um, total energy would be you know, the summation of all the energy that the radiometer experiences okay. uh, when moving on the lamp. And um, typically, these two variables, peak irradiance and total exposure, um, are going to be uh, measured at a, at a single specific wavelength or wave-like band. Um, some radiometers only measure a single wavelength band. I believe UVA is most common. Other radiometers will measure, they'll have multiple sensors and they'll measure multiple wavelength bands in single measurements. So hmm. uh, I believe the largest radiometers measure usually about four wavelength bands. And it would be similar to these sorts of diagrams where you have an absorbance um, within a specific region here, um, and then a, another um, absorbance at a, at a lower region down there. And um, I believe that's uh, my entire UB101 presentation. So uh, thank you for uh, sitting through this and answering some oh, questions. Brilliant. That was, that was great. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, very, very enlightening. Uh, I have a few questions here. Uh, yeah. We never, uh, one of the things we never discussed was chemistry. Uh, how do you decide on the chemistry? So is it, uh, is it different for different substrates? Uh, is, how do you decide it, or will, will the same thing work with everything? How does it work? So, you know, there's a few different uh, UV chemistry manufacturers um, that are out there in the world, um, and they're all producing different sorts of materials and coatings uh, with different kinds of properties. Uh, when you're trying to identify which coating to use for a process, there's going to be a couple of factors uh, that play into it. I think a large one often that we see is, is cost and, you know, finding the best supplier at the most reasonable cost is, is a fair way to look for the UV chemistry, uh, UV chemistry supplier. Um, another one is going to be which end properties are, are you looking for? So um, different coatings are designed for different applications. Uh, you know, if you want to have a medical application, you, there's very high restrictions on which materials can be used. And oftentimes these materials have to be uh, evaluated and approved by different um, medical boards or evaluation boards. Um, so there's gonna be some chemistries that are available and some that aren't for different processes. Um, but other times it's gonna be just a question of uh, which properties are you looking for and, and which chemistry is able to um, achieve those properties. So, so for wood, there will be a different chemistry if the substrate is wood. Flexible packaging would be different chemistry. Metal yeah. would be a different chemistry. You know, it's, it's a very customized process. Um, and if you're trying to really achieve a high level of um, properties, you're gonna wanna customize your process as much as possible. So when you're talking about putting a UV coating on a wood panel, for example, uh, wood is actually um, not a very uniform material. There's many different uh, ridges and pores in the material. So if you paint a coating onto it, many of it's going to be absorbed into the into the wood itself, into the wood substrate. Um, right. This means that if you're doing a wood coating, uh, you might want to look for a higher viscosity coating, something that wouldn't penetrate deep, or or you might be trying to have it penetrate deep, and you would want a lower viscosity coating. Um, you know, plastic, it's a hard, uniform outer surface. 
uh, you, you wouldn't really be as concerned with the viscosity. And in that sense, you might be more concerned with it in terms of what thickness of coating uh, you're able to achieve. Um, so yeah, certainly the, the substrate plays a large role in, in the selection process. Got it, great. One last question before I let you go. <laughs> How do you decide between an arc lamp, microwave, or an LED? Which is the right technology as an end user? So there's a few different uh, considerations when it comes to uh, UV uh, technology selection. Um, and it has largely to do with uh, the process, what's being made, how much is being made, and what the plans are for the future. Okay. Um, so I'd say if you have a very um, small process, which uh, you're only making 10 parts a year, you probably don't need a very expensive lamp. You could probably get away with a very uh, small lamp, low power, um, could be an arc lamp, which is typically the least expensive technology. Um, and this would be totally suitable for UV curing. Um, if you're trying to get to a very high uh, throughput, you're trying to process uh, many, many parts uh, at a time, you're gonna want a more intense and stable uh, UV source. Um, so uh, the microwave lamp is a great example of an extremely stable and uniform uh, UV uh, lamp system where uh, the spectral uh, distribution is gonna remain unchanged for the entire life of the bulb. Um, and also the uh, uniformity across the bulb is, is very similar. So the energy, no matter where you are underneath the lamp, is gonna be very similar. Um, for LED, uh, there's many different considerations. I think the biggest uh, factor when deciding if you wanna use a UV LED or not would be the, uh, the, the type of coating that you're using. Are, are you using a, a coating that's, uh, you're trying to get some mechanical properties out of, such as hardness? Um, then LED probably wouldn't be the best option um, because it has no low wavelength energy. Uh, if you're trying to just uh, cure, for example, an ink on a surface of a magazine, um, mm -hmm. LED is very effective because it's a very thin coating and uh, you don't really need a scratch resistance or anything. You just need some nice colorful uh, image. Um, LED would be very good for that. So um, another factor that plays a large role um, is the electrical efficiency. Uh, UV LED is the most efficient lamp um, technology that's available. So if you're trying to save energy, um, LED might be a good option, um, but make sure that the coating is um, designed for it. Um, all, all UV technology, technologies in general are uh, environmentally friendly and um, better, better process for the environment uh, than, than a traditional sort of thermal process. Brilliant. All right, Eric, thank you so much for your time. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, and I hope you have a good day. Uh, thank you again. Thanks, Anki. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye.